Tonight on the Worldview Weekend Hour, Lesson 6 in our series on the Book of Revelation. Tonight we look at the Church of Ephesus and their opposition to false teaching and false apostles. The Worldview Weekend Hour begins right now. WVW-TV presents the Worldview Weekend Hour with Brandon House. Whether the topic is law, science, government, economics, history, family, social issues, education, or theology, Brennan brings the issues of today into clear focus through the lens of a biblical worldview. And now, here is your host, Brennan House. Good evening and welcome to the broadcast. Glad you are with us. Here we are, Sunday night, May 5th, 2024. May 5th, 2024. As we bring you our Sunday night church service that I've been teaching on Sunday nights since 2015. And again, if you don't catch us live, you can always watch it on the replay at worldviewtube.com. Worldviewtube. That's again, worldview, T U B E. Dot com, worldviewtube.com. And uh, we're continuing our series as we study through the book of Revelation. And this is lesson six. And if you are appreciating this series, we appreciate your support at wvwfoundation.com. We are also going to endeavor to have all of this transcribed and put up into onto our website as well, transcribed as part of the series, so that you can study this through a transcription as well, putting the transcript below each a lesson. So again, uh, this is all brought to you by our foundation. So if you appreciate these resources, that we make them available, we do appreciate your support at wvwfoundation.com. You'll also find our mailing address there if you prefer to support us through the mail. And thanks to all the outlets that pick up the broadcast. Also our friends uh, at TV30 in Milwaukee. So here we are, lesson number six, as I said, as we study through the book of Revelation. Tonight, we are looking at this topic, the Church of Ephesus. And we're going to look at their opposition to false teaching and false apostles. Their opposition to false teaching and false apostles. You know, the this is the first of the seven letters to the churches. Uh, these churches, as we've discussed in past programs, I believe represents the various types of collection of churches or Christians or individuals in, inside what we call the church, uh, ecclesia, uh, that you will find at any given time. Some people believe that they are representing various church ages. I think it's more accurate to say this represents really any type of collection of New Testament believers or individual believers that you would find at any given point inside these seven churches. The first letter being written to the church of Ephesus. And so uh, we'll begin our study right here, right now. So many people think that uh, pointing out false teaching or false teachers is somehow heresy hunting. And in some regards, we will see that if all you are obsessed with is uh, heresy hunting, then you might be uh, having the wrong motive. You got to make sure you have the right motive. Is it simply because you enjoy being a heresy hunter? Is it because you enjoy uh, arguing? Is it because you enjoy... Uh, the uh, intellectual ascent of the topic? Or is it that you are earnestly contending for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints? Is the ultimate goal because of your love for Jesus Christ? Let me make that very clear. Uh, are we pursuing truth? And one of those things involves pointing out false teaching and false teachers, false prophets, false apostles. Are we doing that because we want to seem smart? Because we, as I said, like to argue, like to debate, like the intellectual study of the topic? Uh, or is it ultimately, uh, be, or is it because we want to puff ourselves up? Why are we doing it? What's our motivation is what I'm saying. And this is something we all should ask ourselves, including your teacher right here. What is our motivation in what we do? Is ultimately the motivation because of our love for Jesus Christ? Christ, that we love Christ so much that we're defending his word. We're defending the exclusivity, the authenticity, the veracity, the truthfulness of the claims of Christ and his word, and we don't want anyone deceived by the lie. You know, the Bible says that, right? Don't let people deceive you. 
over and over in the Bible, do not be deceived, do not be deceived, do not be deceived. The Lord desires that none of us are deceived, and we should not want to see people deceived. We should want them to come to Christ. We should want Christ to be lifted up as the one and only, the preeminent one, right? So do we do, we do what we do out of service to our Lord, right? If someone is speaking ill of your spouse, let's say for, for, for us, particularly as husbands, if someone is speaking ill, lying about your spouse, would you sit there and listen to that? If, if, a, if a husband would sit and listen to someone disparage his wife, lie about his wife, attack her, attack her character and her nature, attack her very person, one that does not speak up, you would have to really question, does he love his wife? Does that man really love his wife? He didn't defend her. He didn't speak up for her. So let me ask you as Christians, as Christians, are we offended when we hear people speaking lies about our Lord? Are we offended? Do we take issue when we hear people distorting Jesus, his character, his nature? How about when we hear people presenting a false Christ, a false Messiah, saying, oh, this is what Jesus is, and it's a social justice Jesus. It's a liberal Jesus. It's a globalist Jesus. It's an open borders Jesus. It's a Jesus who is postmodern. Truth and reality really don't matter. Just your individual experience and feelings, and make Jesus out to be a postmodern Jesus. You find that offensive? A true believer absolutely finds that to be offensive, right? And a true believer would, would speak up because of their love for Christ. You love Christ so much, you don't want to see him in any way disrespected, put down. You don't want to see people deceived. Not only do you love Christ ultimately, but you have a love for other people, and you don't want them to be deceived. Whether believers, and believers can be deceived. Believers can be deceived, right? You don't want to see believers deceived by bad theology or doctrine. You don't want to see unbelievers deceived and believe in a false Christ or a false Messiah. And so you do this because you love your fellow believer and you have a love and compassion for the lost. But ultimately, we do this because of the one we serve. And we defend truth and we defend that which is consistent with his character and his nature, his very person, because of our love and affection and loyalty to our Lord who laid down his life for us, who loved us while we were yet sinners. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we love him so much that we want to obey him. And one of the things that he has told us to do is to what? To make disciples. And to, and to make disciples involves obviously evangelism, right? Well, if you're going to evangelize people, you have to present Christ to them, right? And you don't want them following a false Christ, a false Messiah. The Bible warns about this, particularly in the last days, the rise of false Christs and false Messiahs. And you, because you love the Lord, you want to follow his commands. And one of them is to what? Go ye therefore in the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. That means we must evangelize them first, share with them the good news of salvation through Christ alone. And then we teach them the things about the Lord and about the Bible and how to live the Christian life. And we do this because Christ has commanded us to do this. Because Christ desires that no one should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And it is out of our love for Christ that, we're, that we are disciples and involved in evangelism and discipleship. It is also out of our love for Christ that we defend his word. And the Bible has a lot of commands about what? Ephesians 5.11, have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness, but what? Rather expose it. Expose it. The Bible tells us to be aware of the false teachers that will creep into the church. And we're called to mark them. Mark those. Romans tells us, mark those who are contrary to the doctrine, the teaching of Christ, and expose them. 
What's the point I'm making? Oftentimes, pointing out false teaching and false teachers, particularly in today's age, is ridiculed. That these people are, are unloving, they're intolerant, they're harsh, and people can be unloving and they can be uh, harsh when doing this. And so that is the issue. It's not that we shouldn't do it. And a lot of times, again, people who don't agree with us will label us. You see, they, they don't like the message, so they attack the messenger. But if you're preaching the truth and proclaiming the truth in love, guess what? You still may be called unloving. You still may be called intolerant, harsh, judgmental, unkind, mean. Christ was the very definition of love. And yet, what was he called? He loved us so much, he laid down his life. For God so what? Loved the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And Christ, being God incarnate, deity, the God-man, Emmanuel, God with us, laying down his life, subjecting himself to being a little lower than the angels and laying down his life, and yet he was ridiculed, and he is the very epitome and definition of love. So what's the point of making? Even when we are doing it with good motives, pure motives, and in love, we're still going to be called names. We're going to still be besmirched by the world and the false church and false Christians, oftentimes, and false teachers because they don't know what to do with the message other than to attack the messenger. But here's the issue. Let's make sure. Let's make sure that those that are watching can say, uh, you know what? I see that for what it is. I see that as an attack on that individual that's speaking truth. And they cannot refute the truth that they're presenting. They cannot refute the truth of the Bible, the truth of God's word that is being brought to bear on the false teaching and the false teachers, the false prophets and the false apostles. And this individual is doing this very much so in love and in patience and kindness and gentleness. Maybe with passion, maybe with deep conviction, but they cannot say this individual is doing this out of hatred or animosity or arrogance or is being unkind. So we cannot always convince the one that's being confronted of the legitimacy of our motives. And even if they know our motives are right, they still may lie about us because their arrogance will ref refuses to repent. And so they attack the message because they can't attack they, they attack the messenger because they can't attack the message. But let us let us oppose false teaching and false teachers in such a way that even many in the world that are watching and the brethren that are watching say, wait a minute, that is not, that is not an accurate description of the individual that's earnestly contending for the faith. They are being very kind and loving. In fact, it is because of their love that they don't want you deceived, dear friend. They don't want others deceived. And that is what's going on in part here in the church of Ephesus, as we shall see in our future studies, is that they indeed had orthodoxy. They had orthodoxy. They were contending for the faith. They were pointing out false teachers, false apostles, they were persevering or they were having patience with people who were caught up in this. They were also being sure to avoid people that were wicked. And there's a big difference between proclaiming truth to the wicked and then letting the wicked come inside and play church with you and have a place to deceive the sheep. You don't let the wolves in to play among the sheep. And this church of Ephesus was commended by Christ, by the Lord God himself, the risen Lord. As John the Revelator is taking down this message to be delivered to the angel of this church, Ephesus, as is the case with the six other churches. And the Lord God himself commends them for their labor, their patience, their contending for the truth their opposition to false teaching and false teachers, he commends them for their good orthodoxy and even their good works of labor. But after he commends them, he warns them about losing their love. What is your motivation? 
What is your motivation? Why are you ultimately doing this? What is driving you? What's, your, what's the motive behind it? And so that is, of course, a lesson for every one of us to make sure that we are not so committed to the cause of being right and true that we lose focus of the one to whom we should be ultimately true to. In other words, some people do indeed lose focus of what is the ultimate goal. Why do we contend for the faith? Again, I go back to the questions I asked. So we can be right? So we can argue with people? Because we like to argue with people? Some people, they like to argue, and they become lawyers. And some people are told at a young age, you would be a great lawyer because you love to argue. You should consider going into law. And you know what? I find that in the area of Christian work, that there are those who just love to argue. Is it their love of arguing, even if they're arguing the truth? Or is it their love of the truth, the person of Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life? What is their motivation? Have they lost the love for Christ in the midst of doing a good work. In other words, you can do a good work, but have the wrong motivation. And Christ, after commending their good work, then goes on to explain to them his desire for them to not lose the first love that they had, to return to their first love, to do this out of their deep commitment to not argue, arguing, not out of their love of a good fight, if you will, not out of impure motives, but do this ultimately out of your love for Christ. And I have seen this myself, and it's one I've had to guard against myself, uh, and that is I see people in my line of occupation, particularly those of us who are involved in evangelism or apologetics, where we're pointing out false teaching that's coming against truth. We have to make sure our motive is right, that we're doing it out of our love for Christ. Even though what we're doing is good and right, and it's a mandate, we should do it. We still have to ask, what is our ultimate motivation? Is it out of our love for Christ? Also, is it out of our desire to evangelize the lost? So this is this book. This book of Revelation, chapter 2, that we enter tonight with this. The Church of Ephesus, Opposition to False Teaching and False Apostles. We'll get as far as we can tonight. Robert L. Thomas says, the prominence of this church of Ephesus is reflected in its being the possible recipient of as many as eight New Testament books. The Gospel of John, Ephesians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, and Revelation. Besides, Paul was ministering in Ephesus at the time he wrote 1 Corinthians. This is a very historic city, Ephesus. John Walford writes, there is reason to believe that the Apostle John himself, now exiled on Patmos, had succeeded Timothy as the pastor at large in Ephesus. It was to this church and to Christians living in Ephesus at the close of the first century, some 30 years after Paul, that the first of the seven messages is addressed. This is a very historic city with these fellow believers and with this as the backdrop, let's begin. As we open our Bibles, if you have them, if not, we'll put it on the screen so you can follow along. And we find ourselves now entering chapter 2 of Revelation. Chapter 2 of this book of Revelation. And here's what we read. To the angel of the church in Ephesus. Now, who is this angel? We had discussed last week that I believe that these are not angels as in a spirit angels, spirit entities, angels, like a guardian angel, that these are actually men. That word for angels in the original is one who is a messenger. And I believe that th these are actually men. And, and God has his messenger for each church age. And sometimes when the men that are supposed to be the leaders or the pastors are not leading, God will call up his messenger. And they may not have a formal position in the local New Testament church, but God will use them to be his messenger. And I see that here now. Many, many wonderful messengers 
are not pastors in the sense that they are a senior pastor or pastor on a staff of a church and a New Testament fellowship, but they are just ministers, messengers, if you will, speaking for truth. And you find them where? On the radio, Christian radio. You find them on online now. Because as so many churches sadly have ceased in preaching the complete gospel, as they have sought to go to pop psychology, as they seek to entertain, tickle ears, will not speak about things such as the book of Genesis, because we don't want to argue things that are controversial like creation versus evolution. I told you a few years ago, I've said this story once, we wanted to hold our contend conference as we've had here in the Mid-South for several years that we would hold absolutely for free. And we'd bring in all these wonderful speakers to speak to high school, junior and seniors in high school, and then college students. And we would fill it up from students all around the country. We did this several years in a row and we would make it all free. They would travel here and pay for their own hotel, but we made the conference free as a ministry of our foundation. And we bring in these speakers to explain to them the issues that they have to contend for in their day and age and how to rightfully divide the word of truth and to contend for the faith and not be taken spiritual prisoners of war or cheated by the philosophies of men that are not according to Christ. And one of the churches we wanted to rent their auditorium, their fellowship hall, and we were willing to pay, when I was going down the list of things we we're going to talk about, I mentioned we were going to talk about Islam and the threat of Islam, and postmodernism, and moral dilemmas, and creation versus evolution. And the ministry of the church said, well, do you have to speak on something so controversial? And I thought he meant Islam. You mean Islam? No. It wasn't Islam he was thought was so controversial. It was the topic of creation versus evolution. <laughs> he thought, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I wasn't expecting that. I would thought he was going to have an issue with us speaking about Islam. So controversial. You know, you might, you might have bring our church under attack. No, he wasn't worried about that. He didn't want us talking about creation versus evolution. That was considered controversial. Isn't that the sad state of affairs? And this was a church that prides itself in being evangelical. The name evangelical is in its church name on its sign out front. And they're afraid to talk about creation versus evolution for fear that that would be perceived as controversial. You know what else they didn't want to talk about? Bible prophecy. They didn't want to talk about Genesis, and they didn't want to talk about Revelation, the two bookends. And you wonder why it is that today many of the messengers of the New Testament church, messengers, people that speak for truth, of the church, the church being ecclesia, called out ones. A church is not a 501c3 on some street corner somewhere. The church are, are those who have placed their faith and trust in Christ. And yes, they gather together in what are known as New Testament fellowships. But much of what we call churches today are really not churches. In fact, they may be much like we find in Laodicea. Christ is outside knocking to get in. And I believe it's at this time, and it's been at previous times in church history, that God will ra raise up men to speak truth, even if they hold no official title in a local New Testament church, but they are his messenger. So fear not, my friends. God always has his man. He always has his messengers. And I believe that's exactly what we're Describing here the angel of the church in Ephesus. In fact, John Wolverd says the messenger of the church at Ephesus, which at the time was a large metropolitan city, was undoubtedly an important person and Christian leader of the time. And as we saw in our previous studies, Robert L. Thomas says this is an individual, these individuals, these angels of the various churches, likely held no formal position. Here's my challenge to you as I did last week. Are you a messenger for the church today? Are you a messenger of God today? Are you willing to carry forth a message that may be very unpopular in most so-called New Testament churches? Some of the greatest opposition we have received in this entire history of this ministry has been from those who claim to be evangelical Christians, those who claim to be pastors, those who claim to be churches. And we're thankful for the real shepherds and the real pastors. But this is, this is the problem we have in much of America today. Some of our greatest opposition comes 
from those who claim to be Christians and pastors, and they don't want to speak the truth for fear that it might be unpopular and not attract nickels and noses. And then that's when we have to have people that are willing to speak the truth and be messengers. Are you willing to be a messenger and speak truth when others won't? Look at this. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now, last week, we determined that the seven stars, again, are these representatives, these messengers called angels. The original text means, again, messengers. These seven angels in his right hand are these seven messengers. And the seven lampstands, golden lampstands, are representing the church and the church age. And he says that he is moving among them. He's walking among them. He's observing. And we're hearing his observation about these seven churches in these seven letters. Tonight, looking at this letter to the church of Ephesus. And the churches are to be light. As I said last week, he said, I am the light of the world. And then he says, after he comes into the world and has proclaimed the true gospel message and the church is born, then he says, ye are the light of the world. The church is to reflect Christ. That's what we go back to. Are we reflecting Christ? Are we claiming to represent Christ, maybe even with a good message of defending the faith and pointing out false teaching and false teachers, but we're not ultimately doing it to represent Christ. Maybe we're doing it to represent ourselves. Maybe we're doing it to represent our own arrogance or pride or intelligence. Let's pray that we're doing it the right thing for the right reasons. Because people can do the right thing for the wrong reasons. And there are those who even preach the gospel who only do it for profit. Praise the Lord, the gospel is being preached. But wouldn't it be much better to do the right thing for the right reason? The right motive? And be that light that shines forth. The light being Christ and him shining through us as the church represented by the lamp stands. I know your deeds, says the Lord. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. Now he's writing again to this church in Ephesus. I know your deeds. I know your hard work and your perseverance or your patience. Sometimes we have to have that perseverance or patience when dealing with people, right? Now notice something here, <laughs> something that any of us that manage people, work with people, administrate anything, and thus have to deal with people or get to deal with people. One of the things we find the Lord doing here is what? He's, he's praising them up, up front for the good things. Now, he is going to tell them where they're falling short and where he has some concerns, no doubt about it. But the Lord starts out by commending them and their fact that he sees their deeds, their hard work. The, the text used here, the words in the original hard work, is one, they literally have become physically fatigued. Weary. Not weary of the work, but weary in the work. Isn't that a big difference? The Bible says don't become weary of well-doing. Doesn't mean we won't become weary in well-doing. Oftentimes, you're physically drained. Emotionally, spiritually, physically. Even our Lord with his human side, fully God, fully man, had to get away and recharge and have a time of solace and prayer and restoration and, real, and to be replenished again for ministry. Don't confuse becoming weary in your work for the Lord with being weary of your work for the Lord. Oftentimes, I become weary in the work that I do, but I don't become weary of the work. But the Lord God is acknowledging the fact that they are working hard, even to the point of physical and spiritual and emotional toil. It's a physical, emotional toil, and they're working hard, and they have great perseverance or patience, and he commends them for it. Look at this, Hebrews 4, verse 13. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. The Lord is watching our lives even now and taking account. And of course, 
for us as believers, we as again at the Bema seat will receive rewards according to our work. Has nothing to do with our salvation. Justification instantly by faith alone. But then that sanctification process, that ongoing faithfulness and obedience, and the Lord is keeping a, a tally. Store up treasures in heaven where moth and dust and rust don't corrupt. And there's going to be a reward, not for salvation, but a reward at the Bema Seed for serving Christ. He's watching and he's taking note of our hard work and our patience and our endurance. He understands. He understands what we're going through. Because again, he was fully God, yet fully man. He understands the physical emotional toil of ministry and particularly ministry with people. And isn't that the biggest part, folks? Isn't that the biggest drain oftentimes is toiling and being patient with people as you work in ministry? But be encouraged tonight. The Lord knows all too well what it is you're going through. For he experienced it as Emmanuel. And he's taking note and he's watching. And there's a reward coming for those of us that persevere and that work and toil for the Lord. Notice what the scripture goes on to say. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. So he commends their work and their patience or perseverance. And then he says, and I know that you can't tolerate wicked people. And folks, that's a good thing, right? Now, there's one thing to say, well, are you saying we, we're not to have any contact with wicked people? No, we, we evangelize the lost. But as this church, they're not going to have a tolerance for it. And today isn't so much about tolerance, postmodernism. Truth and reality are created by man, not by God. And anytime you say, whoa, 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 that's wrong. And you quote the scripture, now you're being very intolerant. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. The exclusivity of Christ. That's not tolerant in today's postmodern world. And there are many things that we as Christians must not tolerate. And we certainly don't tolerate them in the midst of the New Testament church and the New Testament fellowship to distort the gospel, to distort the biblical uh, mandates of Christians, and to confuse baby Christians or even to con uh, confuse or uh, disrupt the fellowship of older saints. We guard the flock. We don't let people that are wicked come in. Does that mean we don't want to have contact with sinners? No, we want to evangelize the sinners. But we do not let the wolf, as I said at the beginning of the broadcast, we don't let the wolf come in and set up shop in the midst of the sheep. We keep out the wolf, the wicked and they didn't tolerate them. And there was much wicked in Ephesus. Indeed, there was. Robert L. Thomas says this, the religious life of Ephesus revolved about the worship of the Greek goddess Artemis, identified with the Roman goddess Diana. Her 425 foot long by 220 foot wide temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Besides being a religious center, the temple was a gathering place for criminals and the scene of widespread immorality. Criminals came there in droves because it provided them an asylum where they were safe after committing a crime. Prostitution thrived there because the immoral activities were looked upon as sacred and the prostitutes themselves were viewed as priestesses. Please understand what's going on here. This pagan Debauchery, immorality it is beyond even description in some cases and one that I don't even want to describe here. But they even went so far as to believe that if they wanted to have a closer union with their false gods, they could be involved in sexual relations with temple prostitutes. And you want to talk about wicked. Again, some of the things going on, I don't even want to describe. But you can find the historical, extra, outside of scripture, historical data that describes what was going on here. And we are indeed talking about very wicked people. The Apostle Paul himself, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 20-21 says, O Timothy, 
Guard what was committed to your trust. Avoid the profane and the idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. We're warned against this idea that somehow we're to get involved in occultic or mystical activities to obtain hidden knowledge. We even see this invitation right away in Genesis chapter 3 where Satan says to Eve, Here, eat of this fruit and your eyes will be open. Esotericism, hidden knowledge, so called. It is false knowledge. Esotericism. And much of pagan rituals, occultic, demonic, Luciferian activities, then and now, through the ages, is promising that if you engage in these things, you somehow can have a deeper understanding of hidden truths or so-called knowledge. And indeed, the church in Ephesus understood the very wicked people. Now, notice again that Robert L. Thomas says that around there in Ephesus, the religious worship revolved around this Greek goddess named Artemis. Now, any of you that have read my book, uh, The Coming Religious Reich, which came out in 2015, know that I spent a considerable amount of time studying the, well, really false system of Babylon, the mother-son cult, Genesis 10 and 11, and that we're going back there as described in Revelation 17 and 18. And I spent many, many, many hours tracking down the history of what I'm about to reveal to you to give you an understanding of Artemis and how this is really going on yet today. And I believe going to actually come and have a crescendo once again as we move into Revelation 17 and 18 and the end of time. Look at what I was writing about then. What is Libertas? A Roman goddess. Libertas, a Roman goddess. The Greek equivalent of Libertas, as I did my study, and this took so many hours. I remember going through this. The Greek equivalent of Libertas is Eleutheria. Eleutheria is the Greek name or epithet for Artemis. Ah. Artemis is Diana in the Roman world. Remember Diana? An Acts. Diana is widely known to be Semiramis, or the Queen of Heaven, or the Queen of Babylon. This is what's going on in Ephesus. The worship of Artemis, which is tied back to Diana. And you say, oh, those, these are the things of the past. Oh, no. These are things that have been going on really since Genesis 10 and 11 and the Tower of Babel and the mother-son cult, and it's going to continue, and it is today by many names, Mother Earth, Gaia, Earth Worship, Goddesses. Look at this. Eleutheria, Strong's Greek New Testament Dictionary defines the word in part as fancied liberty, license, the liberty to do as one pleases. Eleutheria, Strong's Greek New Testament, tells us that this is the, the celebration of a type of liberty that gives you license to do as one pleases. Doesn't the Bible say that and increasingly in the last days men will do what is right in their own eyes? Many people think of the Statue of Liberty as being about liberty. But what kind of liberty is it? Hold on, I'll explain. There is a connection. Look at this. Acts 19, verses 23 to 28. About that time, there arose a great commotion about the way. Christianity at this time, the church has just been born in the early book of Acts, and it was often known as the way. The church was called the way, probably because of that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father except through me. And so the church, or Christians, were often known as following the way. And here's that text. About that time there arose a great commotion about the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. 
Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. Paul's hurting their business, their profit, their bottom line, their trade, their commerce. What are we going to do? So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed whom all Asia and the world worship. Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, great is Diana of Ephesus. So again, you say, what's the connection? Diana, Artemis, Diana, Semiramis, different names, part of the Babylonian system coming out of Genesis 10 and 11, being passed down through time, depending on what we're talking about, Romans or the Greek, various names, same mother-son cult, and it's coming back again in Revelation 17 and 18, and I think that's going to be a literal Babylonian system 58 miles south of Baghdad, as we find a Eurocentric world government based upon the Babylonian religious system. So again, we say, well, the Statue of Liberty, that's all about liberty. What kind of liberty? Liberty as in freedom from oppression from big government? Liberty as in freedom found in following the laws of nature and nature's God, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty or there is freedom. Are we following the character and nature of God as it's supposed to be with our constitutional republic here in America? What the divine is ruled on, we don't rule against. And when you follow the way of the Lord, there's great prosperity and abundance and liberty. Liberty for the family. Liberty for carrying out the biblical mandates of a marriage and children and family. There's liberty for the church to preach, to teach, to proclaim. There's liberty for those who make up the, a family or New Testament believers who are in our church. There's liberty for them in their business and their private property to use their money to provide and be a blessing for others, provide for their family, be a blessing to others, to preach the gospel. There's great liberty when we follow the template for family government and church government and civil government. After all, civil government being what? Individuals coming together collectively to defend individual rights. There's great liberty. We all love liberty that understand it. We love liberty. And the, many come to America at one time, they did, wanting liberty. But what kind of liberty do people seek today? Much of what they seek today is the liberty that is to do whatever they want to do, whatever they say is right, despite what God says, in contrast to what God says. They hate what God says. They want to be liberated from any confines of the character and nature of God. And many want to destroy our constitutional republic because they do not want the limits that have been imposed upon our nation historically, legally, in past times by a constitutional republic based on the character and nature of God, thus saith the Lord. They don't want that. They want a licentiousness liberty to do as they please, to redefine marriage, redefine family, Redefine the purpose and intent of government as defined by God himself in places such as Romans 13, reward the righteous and punish the wicked. If you want to not fear the government, do what is right and you'll have no fear. But what happens today? Those who want to do right, they're the ones who are now afraid because we've thrown off the template of government as created by God that we are to implement for real liberty. And they've thrown off these constraints thinking that it will actually bring liberty of their type and of course what they find themselves doing is being enslaved not only by bigger and harsher government but they find themselves being enslaved by sin and lies and there's no liberty at all but we're not talking about the same kind of liberty that we would celebrate say on the fourth of july in america this is a liberty of licentiousness to do as they please whatever their heart desires and that brings me back to the Statue of Liberty. What does this really represent? Is this Semiramis? Well, 
Here's the Congressional Medal of Honor Society. This is not me saying this, the Congressional Medal of Honor Society. In 1965, the Air Force Medal of Honor was created and it replaced the Minerva portrait with the head of the Statue of Liberty. Lady Liberty has a pointed crown instead of a helmet and she does stand for liberty, although she is derived from the imagery of Semiramis, wife of Nimrod and queen of Babylon. Who's saying this? It's the Congressional Medal of Honor Society, not Brandon House. The Statue of Liberty represents, folks, the Queen of Babylon. Semiramis was famed for her beauty, strength, and wisdom and was said to have built the famous Hanging Gardens of Babylon. She purportedly re reigned for 42 years after taking control from Nimrod. She's a mythical figure who might somewhat base be based upon a historical figure. The National Park Service says her torch represents what? The idea that light or enlightenment is needed to achieve freedom. You have to see freedom or know it exists to achieve it. Really, what kind of enlightenment? What kind of enlightenment? Sadly, it's a man-centered enlightenment. The idea that you can find truth through various mystical experiences. Look at this, again, from the National Park Service website. The robe represents Libertas, the Roman goddess of liberty and freedom. Really? Libertas. Here's a Roman coin known as a denarius. Looks like the Statue of Liberty, does it not? This is not new in time. So isn't this interesting? If we go back to the original slide here, what do we see? Libertas, Roman goddess, the Greek equivalent is Libertas is Eleutheria. Eleutheria is the Greek nickname for, or epitaph for Artemis. Artemis is Diana in the Roman world. Diana is widely known as Semiramis, or the Queen of Heaven, or the Queen of Babylon. It's part of the mother-son cult. Started in Genesis 10 and 11. It's a false gospel system. I don't have time to go into great detail about it tonight, but it is a false gospel system created hundreds of years before the birth of Christ. And today, Libertas or Eleutheria, Artemis, Diana, Semiramis have many names, Mother Earth, Gaia, Gaia Earth Worship, Venus. And the Bible says that they were very aware of this system there in Ephesus and this temple and Artemis or Diana. And they didn't have any patience for it. And God commends them for rejecting this wicked religious pagan system. We also see in the text, the Lord says to them, Not only do I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, but that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not. You know, the Bible tells us Christ himself in Matthew warns us about the rise of false prophets and apostles, right? We see this over and over again. And here's the Lord commending them for testing these people, pointing out the false prophets, the false teachers, the false apostles. Look at this, 1 John 4, 1 John 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Mark 13, verse 22, for false Christ and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Demonic, potentially demonic activity going on to deceive people, but not the elect. The elect will not be deceived by a false Christ. Doesn't mean Christians can't be deceived, but Christians will not be deceived by false Christ, false messiahs. Because many people don't finish the verse here. If possible. Again, does it mean that Christians can't be deceived? Does it mean that Christians can't uh, be misled? But when it comes to a false Christ or a false messiah, they are not going to accept that. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 14. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transfer, transforming themselves into what? 
apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Look at what George Wood said about this idea of false apostles. And by the way, notice the text says, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. It doesn't say they transform themselves into apostles of the church. Did you know there are apostles of the church? Apostles, little a, messengers, missionaries. But the text doesn't say, Ooh, look out for those people that masquerade as apostles of the church. No, they, we're warned that they're going to masquerade as apostles of Christ. You see, that's a big difference. There's a big difference between a missionary today, apostle, little a, a messenger, or sent one, a missionary, and one claiming to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ who receives exclusive or divine revelation, new revelation, and can do signs and wonders and rule over the church. We don't have those today. They say, wait, wait a minute, Brandon, you, of course you're going to say that. You're, you're not from the uh, maybe Pentecostal, or you're not from the Charismatic, or you're, from, you're not from the New Apostolic Reformation crowd, so of course you're going to say that. Well, let me go to the former superintendent of the Assemblies of God, because he's warning. He's warning about these false apostles. Here's what he said years ago. The church could no longer rely solely on written scripture for doctrine. That's what this new apostolic reformation teaches that's made up of these new prophets and apostles. Complete nut jobs. It would have to develop the fivefold ministry of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers from whom the church could learn rulership. These new so-called apostles and prophets' words he says, would be obeyed and not judged or tested by the church. In other words, they, were to, they, would, they would say, thus saith the Lord, you better follow me. You're not to judge me. I'm, I'm, I'm an apostle or prophet sent from God, and you're not to judge me. Touch not God's anointed. And all the other twisted scripture they'll use to deceive people as false prophets and false apostles. And the superintendent of the Assemblies of God, George Wood at the time, was saying, you better look out for these guys better look out for them. The door would be open to ongoing revelation through which God would reveal components of his will and ways not found in the Bible. That's what they're going to do. They're going to be giving you extra biblical revelation. You better look out, he says. The revived church anticipated by the kingdom now proponents would demand a new breed of Christians. The kingdom now, these are people who think they're establishing the kingdom of God on earth themselves. A theocracy, a religious government taking the seven mountain mandate, if you will, Christianizing the world and creating a religious governmental system. We don't build God's kingdom in the physical realm here. Daniel 2 says God brings his kingdom. We preach the gospel. We evangelize, but God brings his kingdom, Daniel 2. And it will crush Satan's kingdom. And of God's kingdom, there'll be no end. But he says, th this is what they teach that they need some kind of new breed of Christians, supermen, superwomen. Believers would be taught that they are more than human. They could raise the dead and do all kinds of things. You say, well, wait, wait a minute. Didn't Jesus say the things that I do, you'll be doing greater things? Meaning, not that you're going to be raising the dead. We see the apostles able to do great signs and wonders to give uh, authenticity to the message they were preaching and teaching. But as George Wood's about to point out, once those apostles left the scene, we don't see any criteria for replacing them. And, and greater works, what, what are you talking about, Brandon? We here today, we're seeing the gospel go forth like you can't imagine. This broadcast here is going worldwide. It's amazing the works that we can do through the technology and the reach. Amazing. Some Kingdom Now adherents go beyond being little gods to holding to the possibility that we are the manifested sons of God. The race of Christians whose bodies will be transformed not only by coming of the Lord, but by his inner secret coming from within themselves. In other words, they teach that Christ will secretly come to a small group of people. They will be empowered to rule over everybody else, to get all this extra biblical revelation, to do all these signs and wonders, and they will claim it will be a secret indwelling, and they will be sinless. 
that these new superhuman Christians, so-called, will be sinless and do all these things. And the superintendent of the Assemblies of God is saying, you better look out for these people. You better look out for these people. He goes on to say, on August 6, 2001 report released by the General Presbytery of the Assemblies of God. Quote, it is clear, also clear, that while the apostles with the elders were established leaders in the early church, there was no provision for their replacement or continuation. Here's the assemblies of God. Why am I quoting them? So that you can't say, oh, this is just you, Brandon. You're not a charismatic, so you don't. Well, look, here's the assemblies of God in 2001 saying, folks, there is no continuation for these prophets or apostles. Once they went off the scene, we don't see it. We see deacons, we see elders, we see missionaries, we see evangelists, we don't see prophets and apostles. So you better look out. No wonder Christ says, look out for those who claim to be apostles of the church. The Assemblies of God goes on to warn in 2001. It is instructive, however, that nowhere in the New Testament after the replacement of Judas is any attention given to a so-called apostolic secession. No attempt was made to replace James, son of Zebedee, John's brother, executed by Herod, Acts 12, verse 2. Other than the original appointments by Christ himself, there is nothing, nothing concerning the appointments of apostles. And apart from the criteria set for the selection of Matthias in Acts 1, verses 21 to 26, and the criteria implied in the actions of Jesus and the account of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 11, there are no directions for making such an appointment. By contrast, there are clear qualifications and instructions for the appointment of elders, overseers, and deacons. We see that in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13, and Titus 1, Five through nine. But we, we don't see anything for apostles. The Assemblies of God says it seems strange that apostles of Jesus Christ, concerned about faithful preservation of their message, would provide for the appointment of overseers or slash elders while ignoring their own secession if, if such were indeed to be maintained. In fact, there are certain exegetical hints the apostles of Jesus Christ are not to have successors. And we come back next week. We're going to see that there in the scriptures are three kinds of apostles. Apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. There were 12 of those. Apostles of the church. We have those today. Little a messengers are sent ones, missionaries, if you will. And then we have false apostles. And isn't it interesting that we're warned in the scripture to be aware of those who are claiming to be apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why don't they claim to be apostles of the church? Because they want to steal the authority that they think they can achieve through their lies by claiming they are apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we're warned in the scripture to look out for those who masquerade as apostles of Christ. Now again, we have looked tonight with the very fact, and we'll see, by the way, what it took to be an apostle of Christ and why we don't have those today. But what we need to understand in closing tonight is that Christ is commending Christ is commending the church of Ephesus for not tolerating the wicked. He's, he's commending them for their hard work and their toil and their patience. He's commending them for testing those who claim to be apostles and they're not. They're cla they claim to be apostles and they are not. Clearly, we are called to point out false teaching and false teachers, false Christ, false messiahs, false prophets, false apostles. And we'll continue this study. Next week, I guess, is Mother's Day, so we'll <laughs> take off for Mother's Day and come back, Lord willing, the next week and look at what it took to be an apostle so we can know that they're not for today. One of them is you had to see the risen Lord, no one see, whom we have not seen, yet we love. But sure, there are, there are elders, overseers, evangelists, deacons. But then we're going to see that Christ, after commending their work, Ephesus, he goes on to say, but wait a minute, even on top of all these great things you're doing and you're laboring and your deeds and you're not putting up the wicked and you're pointing out false apostles, I want to talk to you about something I see, and that is you don't love me like you first did. Something is going to be pointed out to them to work on. And again, I believe we're going to see a message in all of these seven churches that 
We could find at any given time in the church age and even now among Christians in New Testament fellowships around the world. And it's a warning, particularly as we move into this time and age of great deception. So, but there's some good news tonight. Christ is looking for messengers. He has his messengers. And he's looking at our deeds and our work. He's aware of what we're doing. He's keeping a list, a tally. We'll receive something at the Bema Seed, those who have persevered and have done this good work. Not for salvation, but for his honor, his glory. And then we also know that he is commending those of us that are seeking to protect the church, the flock, from the men who've risen from within, who claim to be apostles and prophets, who are indeed what they are, false teachers. This is a good and high and godly calling. But all the more so, obviously, when it's done with the right reason, the right motivation, and the ultimate test is, are you doing this out of your love for Christ? That's what he's going to say to them as we gather together and study this letter to this church in Ephesus again at our next time. If you appreciate this broadcast, we appreciate your support. You can do that simply by going to wvwfoundation.com, wvwfoundation.com. And again, uh, after we go off the air, we'll put this up at worldviewtube.com, worldviewtube.com for you to share with your family and friends or to watch it again. Again, we'll take off next week uh, but uh, because of Mother's Day. But here we are on Sunday, May 5th, 2024. And it's been a great lesson number six. We look forward to lesson number seven, the following two, two weeks from now, Lord willing, as we continue with lesson seven. Till next time at Brandon House, thank you so much for watching. Take care.